I'd like to invite you to play a guessing game with me. My best friend Mimi has graciously offered her life story for our game. So I'm going to tell you a scene from Mimi's life, and then we're all going to answer the same question over and over again. And that question is, is this estrogen-raising drug a life-saving miracle of modern medicine? or a terrible toxin that will lead to cancer. So, if your answer is lifesaver, give me a thumbs up. If your answer is toxic, give me a thumbs down. And if you have no idea, give me a thumbs together for I don't know. First scene, the year is 1981. The place is a large and well-worn out dorm room with three twin beds. Mimi wakes up with her head pounding from the last night of partying, which ended in her having sex with her new boyfriend for the very first time. Suddenly, Mimi's heart starts racing. <gasps> what did I do? As a familiar pregnancy panic sets in. And then she remembers, I started the birth control pill two months ago when I met the new boy, her heart calms down and her head continues to pound. Lifesaver, toxic, or I don't know. Scene two, the year is now 1996. Mimi wakes up to the familiar pain of period cramps and she tiptoes out of bed so as to not wake up her sleeping husband. She gets to the bathroom and she cries bitterly. I'm not pregnant again. That afternoon, she calls the fertility doctor. And at the age of 35, she undergoes three rounds of in vitro fertilization treatments. And finally, she gives birth to twins. Lifesaver, toxic, or I don't know. 11 years later, one of those twins, her daughter Anna, is curled up in a ball in the school nurse's office with period pain so bad she has to leave school again. Mimi picks her up and takes her to the doctor who suggests that Anna start birth control pills. But Mimi has a lot of questions about the long-term consequences of pill on her young daughter's developing body that no one can answer. So she takes ibuprofen, adult strength, doubles it, and gives it to her young, small daughter and ships her off to school. Toxic? Lifesaver? Or I don't know. And here's our final scene. The year is 2016. Mimi wakes up drenched in sweat from the hot flashes she had all night. She is a few months out from recovering from a hysterectomy. After surgery, her doctor gave her an estrogen patch, which she refuses to take because she's so afraid of a breast cancer. She goes to work where she has trouble focusing. And finally, her boss takes her aside. His patience is done. And he says, your job is in jeopardy. So that afternoon, she fills her prescription and reluctantly puts on the estrogen patch. Lifesaver, toxic, or I don't know. Now I bet that some of you have already played this guessing game with your own body. I certainly have. And we don't have to do this anymore. I am here to tell you about a simple estrogen metabolism DNA test which looks at how well your unique body gets rid of excess estrogen in your urine and your sweat. And every woman needs to know this, because if we don't do this well, there exists a possibility that some of it may recirculate in your bloodstream and over time potentially become toxic. And luckily, by using just a few simple remedies, we can improve how our genes function and get rid of any toxins. Now imagine 
if Mimi could sleep through the night and not worry about her estrogen patch giving her breast cancer. Why is Mimi so worried in the first place? In 2002, the Women's Health Initiative published the early results of a huge study which showed that hormone replacement therapy raised breast cancer risk. And the results of this study were widely publicized around the world. What Mimi doesn't know is that the Women's Health Initiative later revised these conclusions, stating that there were many more factors involved in any raised breast cancer risk. And these revisions were not widely publicized. So let me take a step back and just uh, talk about estrogen. What is estrogen? Estrogen is a group of hormones, the strongest of which is called estradiol. Normally when people say estrogen, they're really talking about estradiol. Estradiol is naturally made in our ovaries and a weaker form of estrogen is made in our fat. It's called estriol. And then there's all the extras or excesses. And I think about them like a tornado. At the top and widest part of the tornado are the strongest extras, which are the estradiol raising drugs that we're talking about. 14% of women ages 15 to 49 in the United States are taking birth control pills at any point in time. Before 1995, 35% of us took birth control pills. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that between 5 and 10% of all couples have sought in vitro fertilization. And they know that 2% of babies born now are the result of an IVF cycle. Over the age of 50, 45% of women have used some form of hormone replacement. And that's a lot of women taking a lot of drugs. And at the bottom of our tornado are chemicals that mimic estrogen. Chemicals in our soaps and shampoos, our sunscreens and our lotions. Chemicals in our meat and our dairy and our food and our water and our cleaning solutions and our pesticides. In the United States, everyone is exposed to a constant drip of estrogen-like chemicals. So imagine if we could get rid of some of these excess estrogens by just following a few simple remedies, like taking some dietary supplements and changing out our products. Would we worry less about the toxins? And what do we mean by toxin? Well, the end of the line definition of toxin is cancer. So that's what scientists study a lot. So let's look at some of their work. In this chart from the University of Nebraska, the women in purple have breast cancer and the women in blue do not. Both groups have a lot of mutations on their estrogen metabolism genes. And I like to show this chart to stress that you can have a lot of damage on your estrogen genes and it doesn't mean you're going to wind up with breast cancer. It does mean you should pay attention to extra exposures, like in our tornado. In 2009, Vanderbilt University looked at a group of breast cancer patients and controls. And what they found was that the breast cancer patients were the ones who had more mutations on their estrogen metabolism genes combined with greater lifetime cumulative estrogen exposure. In 2019, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill published the results of a study where they had followed breast cancer patients for 18 years. And they found was that the patients who did better were the ones who had better estrogen metabolism function. And luckily, we know from thousands of studies how to improve that function. So how do we do that? Well, on a gene-by-gene -gene basis, if you have your test results and you have mutations in the CYP family of genes, you can take a dietary supplement called DIM. DIM is the active ingredient in the mustard family of vegetables. Broccoli, cauliflower, dandelions, and of course, mustard seed. If you have damage in the GST family of genes, a strong antioxidant like vitamin C can help those genes function better. And most of the other recommendations are about avoidance. Avoiding some of these toxic products that I was talking about. So 
The Environmental Working Group is a large non-for-profit that rates products for their toxicity. In their website and in their app, you can learn about what they call cleaner products. Try and buy meat and dairy with no hormones. And if you have one, stop using pesticides on your lawn. It's really that simple. So if it's so simple, why isn't everybody already taking this test? Well, genetic testing is new. It's a new and evolving science, and that means it takes a lot of money. Labs have to buy very expensive new machinery. Practitioners have to be trained. 15 years ago, there was only one US specialty research lab where a physician could buy this test. And now, there's several dozen. None of these labs take insurance. It's cash only payment. A woman came to one of my talks and went to her doctor and asked him to order the test. But he refused to order it because he said he didn't know how to use it and she didn't need it anyway. And his response was not uncommon. It takes on average 17 years for good research to start becoming adapted in clinical practice. So by that measure, we are on schedule or even ahead of schedule because now there's tens of thousands of medical practitioners using not just this test, but other genetic tests. You can even order this test yourself online. And that's what I told this woman to do. Go get one of the do-it-yourself kits and bring it back to your doctor. Once you have your results, it might be able to help you with decisions we make about sex, drugs, and babies. So I like to start talking about sex with the ovarian life cycle. Once you begin your period, you're left with 20 years, give or take, when your eggs are healthy enough to sustain a pregnancy, after which they're not. But now, 10% and growing of girls are starting their period between the ages of 10 and 12 instead of the norm of 12 to 14. And that means that their eggs are going to be in decline before the norm of 35. That also means they'll start menopause earlier. This is called advanced ovarian aging, and it may lead to the greater and earlier use of these drugs. Now, when I give these talks, usually the first question I get is from a middle-aged woman who doesn't ask about herself and her own body and the hormones that she might be using. She asks about her daughter. And the question might be, should my 15-year-old be on the birth control pill? Or should my 29-year-old start trying to have a baby? And my answer is always the same. The sooner that you and your daughter go get an estrogen gene test, the sooner that you can learn about your own body's capabilities, improve them if you need to, and be in a better position to help your daughter because your own health will be improved. Now, the good news about birth control pills is that they contain a small fraction of the doses that middle-aged women like Mimi took decades ago. And I certainly have absolutely no idea if a 29-year-old should start trying to have a baby. What I do know is that if she already has the information about her estrogen genes, it might be one important data point in a very big decision. So if a young woman knows that she has damage on every single gene, for example, she may decide not to wait to 35 to start trying to have a baby so as to avoid in her theoretical multiple IVF cycles in her theoretical future. In a normal cycle, estradiol ranges from 50 to 200 milliliters. In an IVF cycle, the optimal goal is to reach estradiol levels of 3,000 in order to produce more than a single egg in that cycle. Well, that's 15 times your normal max. And when we're done making babies, there's a lot of options for menopause relief. In 2002, when the Women's Health Initiative came out with their early results, physicians immediately stopped prescribing HRT, and their prescriptions have dropped 
And in the meanwhile, women sought out other treatments and the use of bioidentical compounds, sometimes called BHRT or hormone balancing has increased 2,500%. And we don't even have numbers on natural supplements that you can get over the counter in the grocery store online, which may also raise estradiol levels. And we don't have to play this game anymore. Like most women are not going to have a lot of damage on their estrogen genes, and why should they deprive themselves of menopause relief? And on the other hand, a small group of women will have a lot of damage on their estrogen genes, and they may be putting themselves at risk from even natural alternatives. And that's the beauty in what I'm advocating. We don't have to play this game anymore. We can get data about our own body our own unique body. And if we need to improve how our genes work, we can easily do that. And we can stop playing the guessing game. These decisions are very complicated. Cancer is super complicated. And there's lots of risks to these decisions and medications that have nothing whatsoever to do with estrogen metabolism function. So I wanna end by just acknowledging how stressful all of this is trying not to have a baby when you're young, trying to have a baby when you're older, dealing with menopause for decades, and trying to help your daughter is stressful. But a simple DNA test can remove one little piece of the stress by giving you one important data point about your own unique body's capabilities. Mimi took the test, and now she feels better about her estrogen patch. Her daughter, Anna, is now 21, is on birth control pills to regulate her bleeding, and has little side effects. I'm inviting you to stop playing the guessing game. I promise you won't regret it. Thank you.